have been uh, going through an extraordinary year. We knew that we were probably headed towards a recession and then COVID came. How would you characterize its impact on the global economy? Well, of course, the impact has been devastating, but mainly because it hasn't been managed very well. Of course, it was a novelty, a new phenomenon uh, that was hard to control, but obviously some countries have managed it better than others. Uh, mm -hmm. Last week, I gave um, a speech at a big conference in Wuhan, virtually, of course. But I just noticed at second glance that people were running around without masks. And I asked, why aren't people wearing masks in Wuhan? And they said, well, you know, in public places, we still wear masks. But in the office and smaller gatherings, we don't. And that was just so surprising for me to see because, you know, I, I live in New York mm -hmm. and I escaped in, in March. And, the, and I returned later. Um, you know, in the fall, early fall, and it was just devastating what it had done to the economy. So I think the first thing is to get COVID under control somewhat. But of course, the economy had been changing anyways, and so many trends had just been accelerated. But I think the first thing we need to focus on is COVID. And Germany has done a reasonably well job. The U.S. has been catastrophic. Mm -hmm. If you remember December or January of this year, it seemed like the global economy was slowing down. To what degree do you characterize COVID thing as an accelerator of, of these trends that we've been seeing before? Or to what degree do you, do you characterize as a, as a kind of a shift in, in, in global business? Well, I would say many things are coming together here. One issue is trade wars. Of course, the economy always goes cyclically, so it's not going to be linear. There are always going to be ups and downs. And so, mm -hmm. right, I mean, last winter and fall, we saw, you know, challenges building up, and many of them were man-made because of protectionism, which is always contagious. And, of course, was started by Donald Trump in the United States. But layered on top of that was the pandemic, which was to be expected. Um, I have friends in Silicon Valley. They, one of them has a firm that follows, um, it's basically big data, and it follows and prepares for pandemics, and they sell their models to insurance companies and so forth. President Obama had a pandemic preparedness book. So this was also something that was in the pipeline, as exotic as it may seem, and it probably will be in the future. Once corona is through, has worked its way through the system, there may be other viruses or bacteria. So these natural catastrophes always need to be factored in as, you know, kind of like white swans. Um, but I would say that corona exacerbates trends. First of all, accelerates trends, of course, the stay at home economy, but it always also exacerbates trends. Like many companies will now realize, wow, we are just as productive with 70% of people that we have, or maybe even less, and 80% of them working from home. We don't need to you know, have that much office space. So this has a lot of different knock-on effects. However, I will warn, like I write in my book too perhaps, the economy and our society um, are complex self-organizing systems. And now we are, we've been so overwhelmed by latest developments. And now we think linearly. We think, you know, everything is gonna be this horrible forever and it's gonna go down this trajectory and nothing will change. Of course, you know, things are gonna change in unforeseen ways. But we must realize that digitization was already on its way, that artificial intelligence had made quantum leaps, supercomputing. These are things that, you know, while we live our lives, we don't even realize. I'm currently writing my second book and I've done more research. I was actually I'm relatively well informed, but I was pretty shocked to see how far many developments had already progressed. One of them, um, apart from things that may seem exotic like artificial intelligence, it's just simple digitization and uh, contract workers working. This is not just people working from home or working from job to job. This is big monopolistic companies like tech companies, but others outsourcing, but not like they used to be to low wage companies, you know, emerging countries, but to people all over the world. 
contract workers. So for instance, Google, 50% of its employees are only employees, classic employees on the payroll with all benefits. 50% of them are already contract workers. They wear the uniforms, they have the business cards, you wouldn't know. And this is a development, Google, that's Google I mentioned, but like Big Bang, Banks of America, Federal Express, all these big companies. So this is a development that is gaining steam now, of course. Um, the platform economy basically has the same business model where risks are outsourced to workers who have no control and companies have all the knowledge about the business model and the worker. The fact that these people don't have benefits, no pensions, nothing in the bank, no secure job, all the risk is that on their end, the social contract has been upended, mostly in the US, but you know, other countries, you see a cracks too. So there are, I would say, digitization and artificial intelligence are causing tectonic shifts that are much more fundamental than just economic. They have profound implications on our whole society and our, on our lives. And young people who graduate from high school or college today will probably have to change their jobs, careers, many times their lifetimes over and also their skill sets. So they're, they're, I mean, it's a very long answer to a, a concise question, but it's just you know, many complex developments coming together. Well, the question was pretty general, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, what ways of doing business will eventually go back in your in your predictions? Go back to <clears throat> to how it was when we consider a normal pre-COVID um, doing business world, and what what permanent uh, post-COVID uh, changes do you envision from now? Well, going back to the point that many jobs will be partially at least digitized, I think what we will see more and more is, you know, humans, and machi many jobs will not be entirely taken over by machines, but humans need to work more closely with machines. Everything that can be translated into algorithms will be increasingly done by computers. So now it's not just um, assembly line workers or blue collar work, but doctors, lawyers, tax advisors, all these people um, increasingly work with machines. So this is one development that will that was in the pipeline anyway. I think more people will be able to work from home, which is probably a good development. Many people are grateful for that. Many people are going crazy. So I think there will also be a trend towards going back to the office. And like I said, I was in New York and you can just sense people are itching to go back to their old lives. And I think we will find ways to live with the pandemic with you know, protections and medication, whatever else. Because also I think if you ask me, well, what are humans to do if machines take over? I would say the biggest competitive advantage that we have is our being human. Our emotional intelligence and our social skills are the last qualities that will be digitized and be able to be performed by machines if ever. And people will very quickly realize the people who are actually in the office, the people who interact with their bosses, the people who can be on the front lines and actually try to acquire new clients will be more successful. I love the Zoom call, but people are getting tired. They are, you know, they crave personal interaction. Mm -hmm. They want to go to conferences. And I think as soon as that's possible, it won't go back to like it was before, but probably to a larger extent than we fear right now. So I think that is coming back. But all in all, I think we all must factor in that our jobs will change. Also of, of journalists, you know, many jobs are also being performed by by computers, by um, supercomputers. So, um, so I think we all need to be more agile, flexible. We need to disrupt ourselves, just like companies need to dis disrupt themselves, and just live with this, li learn to live with this uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Is the the process of digitization everything, uh, almost everything? Can we turn it into into uh, into our advantage as humans? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I forget which tech CEO it was. Oh, Salesforce. Mark Benioff said, technology is neither good nor bad. It's what we make of it, obviously. And I think that 
you know, I, I wrote in my book about the financial elite, which used to, you know, pull the threats of the of what was going on. And I think increasingly more in, in recent years, their place has been taken over by tech companies. They're the new monopolists, the new industrialists. And like Amazon is taking over first, it started with books, then merchandise, then streaming services, other services, it's going into financial services, uh, transportation, um, all areas, food, of course, supermarkets. So um, they're becoming increasingly more powerful. And, um, and so I think because they have all the money, they're mostly intertwined with politics. I'm, I don't think it's as bad here in, in Europe, but in the US, they have the deepest pockets, like the earliest investor in Facebook, Peter Thiel. It's very close to Peter Thiel Palantir, which is a very important yeah. military funded originally mm -hmm. data firm. Um, and then of course, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is chummy with the Trump administration. Tim Cook walks a very fine line, very diplomatically, and no matter who's in power, they'll let John, and they have all the money. And with their money, uh, one chapter of my book is, we have the best democracy money can buy. And it's not really what's going on in secret behind the scenes. What's really insidious is what's going on out in the open. Lobbyism, the um, you know people going back between the public and private sector, all these things that are actually legal. Um, money and politics is the biggest problem in the US. So I think I'm a little concerned that politics doesn't have an answer to these technological changes. Granted, it's difficult. Um, even in Germany, it's not ideal. You know, politics is short term and these developments are long term, so there's a conflict. But Steve Mnuchin, the finance minister in the US has said that uh, all uh, digitization and robots, that's a development that's like 80 or 100 years out that doesn't even concern us. So they have no answers. They don't want to look at it and they monetize probably the knowledge that they have. So with rising inequality in the United States and the social unrest that we're seeing increasingly more, I'm very, very worried that actually I will say I had a conversation with a tech titan that opened my eyes in New York. It was by chance. I had no idea who was coming by. It was rather, you know, innocuous kind of guy. Started talking. I was like, wow, we could very quickly realize this is a, a brilliant person. And my brain, after a few minutes, couldn't even process what he was telling me. But the bottom line was, who like, what they are. Hmm? Uh, excuse me, who, who was uh, this uh, man? I don't want to say the name. You may not even know him, but he works for one of the biggest tech conglomerates uh -huh. and he's in charge of their artificial AI. So everybody mm -hmm. in the space will know him. I had not heard his name before, but yeah, um, yeah he's written, well, it doesn't matter. But anyway, yeah. the bottom line of what he was telling was we have groundbreaking um, inventions in the pipeline Many of them aren't even public yet. You wouldn't be able to fathom. He threw out some things, but I get, like I said, I couldn't even process. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, the way that society is going to structure itself is there is, you know, this minuscule elite. At least now we have the one percent and ninety-nine percent. This is like the super mini elite, and then all the rest of us. And not only will we be exploited, like now are the Uber drivers and you know all the platform economy workers. But they will become superfluous because then we have self-driving cars and they're not even necessary. What, what, what are people going to do if they're not needed for anything anymore? So I think, yeah, I think we need more leadership. And um, I think it's all our job to put pressure on politicians to make this happen because it's not going to happen by itself. Mm -hmm. has, this, has this been already decided about? <laughs> this conspiracy that um, we just explained? <laughs> I don't think it's a conspiracy. It's like well, I write a book yeah. complex of organizing systems and they have the monopolistic power, which mm -hmm. is network effects. The more power you have, the more power you get, the more money you have, the more you'll get. And with their technological advances, like you and I, we what are we can't keep up with that mm -hmm. normal people. So it's this teeny weeny silicon elite, and we all rely on this new world 
on this new way of life with ordering with Amazon, having Zoom calls. So we are actually giving our power away willingly because it's so inexpensive and so convenient. But in, they end up with all this power. So it's kind of self-perpetuating. It's not like a conspiracy. It's just, but we could, of course, I also write any system that doesn't balance every system after a while becomes more homogeneous and more connected, whether it's an ecological system, like an you know, ant colony, anything in the environment, or a man-made system like a computer system. Mm -hmm. And so after a while it becomes imbalanced and then corrective mechanisms kick in to balance out the system again and we have disabled corrective mechanisms for instance in the financial world mm -hmm. so or in politics so because we have disabled this our system is becoming more and more skewed like with inequality and if we if we don't do anything that's just the way it's going to go mm -hmm. that's also why like i write about in my book these people like a peter Thiel, they all have plan b they're all obsessed with the exit and they don't mean uh you know stock market going public that's not what they mean with the exit they mean the event like actually to their credit they factored in pandemics uh like um a social breakdown you know social disruption somehow this ideal world in their eyes for them is kind of schizophrenically coupled with an Armageddon view. That's what they fear. They see the possibility or possibilities, but at the same time, they realize the danger and that they're, you know, that the line is very fine. Peter Thiel bought property in New Zealand with um, a tarmac so he can land his plane. It's on the water so he can serve like a survival plan. They all have panic rooms and I work with um, wealthy families and they buy farmland in South America or forestry in Canada. So that's kind of disconcerting. Mm -hmm. Looking at financial markets, it seems like the major worries uh, have been already soothed via monetary and fiscal policies. Yet some say that we are far from being out of the woods, given huge portions of the economy's cash flows being impaired. Um, how bad is uh, the slow moving avalanche of insolvency processes going to get in the next year or two in your, in your view? Yeah, that's very hard to judge because insolvencies have the, well, first of all, there are good things, right? Because they clear out the systems of companies who are not competitive anymore. Mm -hmm. But because they always have knock on and domino effects, it's hard to say how they feed through the system. Now that coupled with Corona becomes an even bigger problem because if you look at the US, if, where so many big companies have gone bankrupt and those are just companies that hit the headlines that we're aware of. The medium sized and small companies on every block that are permanently closed, like even in New York alone, people aren't even aware of. You may notice because you live there, but they never make the headlines. Now, the, and the big companies, they probably had the chance to reorganize, whereas many of the small companies will forever disappear. But with Corona, you have the added problem that, first of all, say in the United States, a lot of retail companies went bankrupt, like big, classic, classic companies, uh, I don't know, Brooks Brothers, uh, Victoria's Secret, like all these big names was really shocking, but they can't, first of all, you have to do a sale, go out of business sale if you go bankrupt, right? Well, they all go bankrupt at the same time. Like they all do out of business sale. There are no people who go shopping, mm -hmm. you know, because they were Corona and then the courts are all clogged up, you know, they're either closed because of Corona or there are fewer judges, people don't come to work. Uh, I mean, the whole system becomes overwhelmed if it becomes too much. So it's really kind of too early to tell. I'm very worried. I think it could very well lead to knock on effects. You know, you may be perfectly healthy, but if your clients don't pay their bills, all of a sudden you can't, you know, a, a problem of illiquidity can become a problem of insolvency. So I think the, the downside is big. Politics can do something with um, stimulus to kind of soften the blow and build bridges. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell exactly how it's going to feed through the system, but it could be dramatic. Mm -hmm.
what is going to be the change between the the the, the major players um, interactions uh, so on one hand we have the United States then we have China uh, and European Union in between how different are the global uh, relations going to get in the post-COVID world in your opinion well, I think right now we see a realignment of the system primarily driven by the United States. Arguably, it was already on its way with China, you know, Europe and, and the U.S. both complaining about unfair trade practices with China. But I think probably the most important development is the um, tech cold war between the U.S. and China because, um, you know, tech by its very definition is global and cross-border and already because of the trade wars, many tech companies have relocated away out of China to uh, low wage com com countries like Vietnam or Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think this tech war will add to that. And tech war is just like a trade war. It can't be done. It just does a lot of damage. Big companies like Google, Qualcomm, Apple have all been uh, impacted. Most importantly, Huawei, of course. And um, I think for Europe, the biggest issue will be, first of all, it's a no-win proposition and it will have negative implications for all uh, com companies and countries worldwide and sectors. It remains to be seen. I mean, it would have been much smarter. First of all, I think we should have like a friendly competition with China because we have great benefits from, from that. You know, mm -hmm. you, it's one of the, with the US, the largest economy in the world. And I think the U.S. and Europe together would have been much better suited and equipped to um, negotiate with China. And I think that personal relationships um, don't solve every problem, obviously, but I think they do help. And they do give, a, like I said, in comparison to machines, being our being human is our greatest competitive advantage. And... You know, you can, have the, you can sell the best machines and have the best product. If you don't have distribution channels, um, you can't sell them. And these channels open up through contacts. People do business with other people who they like and trust. It sounds obvious and old-fashioned, but it, it remains true even in the age of machines. What alliances do you think it, it is sensible to continue look, uh, to look for? Is it, in your view, the deepening of the connections within the European Union a good thing? Or do you think that a more relaxed, uh, loose, uh, loose alliance within the European Union would play better uh, in, in the not too distant future? No, I think Europe stands closer together because size gives negotiating power. And versus China and the U.S., I think it makes total sense to negotiate as one. Even I, I realize it's difficult and has some unpleasant implications, specifically for Germans. But I think that's the way to go. I think going forward, there must be less reliance on the U.S. Because even if we get a President Biden or a Democratic president, um, will be more cooperative, predictable reliable, but I think we'll still also pursue protectionist policies. Biden has said so. He, he introduced his economic plan. So it would get better under Biden, but it wouldn't solve the problem. So I think that um, Europe needs to look at other growth markets in Asia, around the world, to become, to become more diver diversified and independent. Is, uh, is technological innovation going to be able to offset the chronic uh, demographic trends uh, in the developed uh, and somewhere also developing world? I think uh, technology can be used for that. I'm not sure if it actually will be. That probably very much depends on financing and in that context that probably depends a lot on politics and so it's possible, but I'm not sure if it's going to happen or to mm -hmm. what extent. Mm -hmm. um, you yourself have been an uh, investment banker in New York City uh, for quite a number of years. Um, how is uh, investing going to change? Uh, how is investing changing right now 
uh, and what is what is it going to look like in like let's say five to ten years time? That's a difficult one uh, to clarify. I'm not an investor. I've never invested money. I was in investment banking. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have never managed money and I, I don't do so now. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that in the last few years, since the financial crisis of 2008, many of the big hedge fund, big wigs and other big investors have had huge losses and really bad years because um, finance has been disrupted by more and more uh, human uh, interaction, like central bankers mm -hmm. and politicians and everybody's kind of meddled in the system to keep it from collapsing. And of course, human decisions are hard to anticipate. And I think a lot more has happened in that space than investors originally thought was possible. And so they mispriced a lot of risks, specifically also with regard to the Europe, even with Lehman, many thought, oh, Lehman is going to be rescued. And then it wasn't rescued. And then, you know, uh, rescue packages wouldn't be, or central banks wouldn't do as much, wouldn't create as much liquidity, or Europe wouldn't stick together and rescue the system in 2010. So I think that realization has created a lot of uncertainty. I think that's probably the key word. I think um, you know, risk you can price and calculate, uncertainty you can't. And I think we've entered the territory of uncertainty. We see a lot of active managers are doing less well than um, passive investors. And uh, those who are big are getting bigger, like BlackRock, for instance, or even Blackstone. Uh, these types of investment firms, we have um, automatic trading, electronic trading. We do have an interesting phenomenon in the United States where a lot of private investors coming in through Robin Hood have really made an impact on market developments, which people probably didn't think was possible. But because of COVID, everybody sat home and then guys couldn't go to sports events. And then they got a lot of money from the government. So I think that was just something to do while they were sitting at home. And then there are some some social media gurus who give tips and you know, influencers, also a relatively new phenomenon, who these guys all followed. So this has created a lot of um, investment activity, which has impacted the market. Where is it going to go? I have no idea. I think we're overdue for a market correction. But as long as central banks pump money into the market, there are just not very many alternatives. In your book, uh, Super Hubs, um, you focus on networks and financial elites. What was actually your motivation for the book? Well, on, on one hand, I would say <laughs> you are part of the world. <laughs> no, I do disclose that in the very beginning of the book that this is not a bank bashing book. This is not an investigative journalism type of book. Um, I will just try to explain this world that I am part of. So take it with a grain of salt. Of course, it's filtered through my lens, but at least I'm, I'm trying to give a relatively objective view. But before you start reading, of course, you realize I'm, I disclose that part of this kind of system. And so I guess because I, I was always asked questions and confronted with conspiracy theories, I just had the urge to... Um, in, in your book, um, do, you, do you present any proposals how to, uh, how to manage th these networks, this big si uh, these uh, big systems in order to avoid their, their, their corruption, their negative effects on the world? Yes, I go into several different respects. One, you know, there are many things that are intangible. We can go and talk about laws, mm -hmm. um, which we should, but our world is changing so quickly. There is a thing called obliquity, which is a concept that's derived from the military, which says when situations are very quickly changing, you need to stay agile. And so if you, if you enact complex stale laws, by the time they come into effect, the world is different, then they create more damage than good. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a certain flexibility. I think the underlying causes are values and our culture. Our culture is determined by the values that we have. And I think that's the unbridgeable difference in the US that we have right now. The bifurcation is in values. 
the Trump followers, for instance, say health insurance or Corona. They say it's, I mean, I was just in a talk show where a Trump follower, after I had laid it out in theory, actually said it verbatim that, you know, there are genetic differences. And Donald Trump uses the term genetics. You have great genes. His ministers need to say, oh, Donald Trump has the best genes. So they think it's a genetic thing. If you get corona and if you get sick or die, that's your problem. I have better genes. And even if you get sick, I, you know, health insurance, Obamacare, I don't want to have to pay for you. What responsibility is it of mine if you get sick? I mean, that's the whole concept of insurance, the mixed calculation that, you know, different risk groups pay in one pot, but they don't want to participate. And um, so that's different values. My values are, oh, if someone is sick, I feel bad. I want to help, you know, within my means. And they say, no, I don't want to help. And um, they are more open to violence. They run around with their guns and, you know, the stronger one should prevail and people who don't carry guns or are against the second amendment are weaklings. So, I say we have the wrong values in our culture. Our culture, like look at the Kardashians, social influencers, people who have been extraordinarily success, successful by our metrics, which is primarily financial or even bank bosses. You know, oh, uh, hedge fund bosses make two billion a year and they look down upon private equity bosses who only make 200 million a year. And they look down on bank bosses because they only make $20 million a year. And they look down on everybody else who makes mm -hmm. less than $20 million a year. Um, so I, and, you know, look what we pay doctors or nurses or teachers. And we've seen who are essential workers really in, in the corona crisis. But we're giving the most money to finan the financial world or a Kardashian who moves for pictures. So, but this is the feedback that we are giving that you know so i think we need to realign our values in our culture and there are different mechanisms through which we can do that and um and again this is where every one of us is, is being asked and then of course political participation the media can do a lot naming and shaming you know trying to change corporate culture there are different levers short of changing the entire system mm -hmm. um where where can the, these uh, where can this ever increasing inequality end? Um, from your experience, talking to Soros, his drag, his Lagards, is is meaningful meaningful tackling of the growing inequality divide ever on their true agenda, or are they are they even not the ones who who uh, really run the business world? Well, in my book, I try to explain the financial world as a complex self-organizing system. And the key characteristic in such systems is that the super hubs, the most well-connected nodes, have the most influence on the system, but they don't have control of the system. And I think that's what we've seen in the financial crisis in 2008. I always give the anecdote that you know, I worked with Nouriel Roubini at the time and we went to Washington and we saw, you know, Tim Geithner and like all these key people behind the scenes, the head of the World Bank and IMF and finance minister and president uh, advisors and so forth. And I thought, you know, I was very scared sitting in New York and I thought when we go to Washington, we'll talk to all these people and they have control of everything. And then They'll assure us of their plan and will tell us what they'll do. And then I will go home all, you know, kind of consoled. What you saw there behind the scenes was nothing short of scary because you saw these people don't have any control. They, some of them don't even know what's going on. Like Ben Bernanke wrote afterwards, even in his book, he wasn't aware of all these extra, of these um, SPV, special purpose vehicles that all these bank hats and the um, you know subprime stuff that was in them had no idea because he had lived in his bubble. Many other people, same thing. So when we left Washington, I was like, oh my God, I have to shoot myself. This is horrible. Will we have electricity in New York? Will we have running water? Um, so this is an example of they don't have control, but if they all stick together, of course, like every human tribe or system, they can make things happen. Same thing happened in Europe and they can do it effectively because they know and trust each other. Um, 
but they don't have control. So I think that this whole issue of inequality, corporate governance, doing good, sustainability, the environment has been increasingly more on the agenda of international conferences and, you know, meetings, whatever, uh, prominently. And I do believe that many people believe that and that their intentions are pure. But we see everything through the lenses of our self-interest. And I think it's one of the key questions I ask in Superhubs, are these people prisoners of our system or are they holding our system prisoner? Mm -hmm. Probably a mixture, but the point is they can't get out of the system while they're in it. So I think even if they're well-intentioned, they left to their own devices amongst themselves, nothing much will happen. We have the proof. Like, what would also happen to balance out a system that's come out of balance would be diversity, putting more women on boards or, you know, higher senior levels or more different ethnicities and age groups and people of socioeconomic different backgrounds, all these things. I mean, this has been proclaimed for the longest time. What has happened? Nothing. Germany, America, same thing. So unless you put pressure or on them. Intellectual and uh, ideological diversity. Excellent point. Exactly. But mm -hmm. it's not happening by itself. What does the New York City look like right now? Well, I, I remember it very well from, you know, the vibrant streets and, uh, you know, the, the rush, uh, the dynamic uh, character. Um, wh what does it look like right now? Okay, it's a little heartbreaking, but you have to realize that the lockdown in New York was much longer and much stricter than in Europe. The trauma that people, the post-traumatic stress syndrome that people have suffered was much worse than here because they went from like normal to people, you know, um, corpses lining up on the streets. Like we had in, in Manhattan, we had these, uh, what's, um, where corpses are cooled, uh, forget what it's called. Oh, um, yeah, you know, there were freezers, like fridges. Oh, yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, the morgues. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and mass graves. I mean, there's pictures that people couldn't even work their brains around that. So they went from this to the opening, which went very, very slowly. I came from Germany, where we also had a lockdown, but life felt much more normal here. Okay, other than masks and mm -hmm. social distancing, pretty normal. New York, completely different. I went into a two week of quarantine when I got there. I will say though that many papers exaggerate, especially the Trump-friendly Murdoch papers like the Daily Mail and New York Post. Uh, despite knowing better, I had read that and taken it to heart. So I was prepared for the worst crime. I thought, you know, there are thugs on every street corner, even on the Upper East Side where I live. It's not that bad. Mm -hmm. So then every day that I was there, it got better. You could tell people wanted to come out and no crime. Of course, there'll be more crime when there's more poverty, but not. it's more in the, at night with gangs and in the Bronx, so not where you're walking around the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So um, so I felt people want, we had dream weather, so everybody was outside. The restaurants could only serve outside. All the restaurants were full. Um, women, older people, all dressed up, you know, jewelry, because they were so happy to socialize. I will say 50% of people are still traumatized. They will not meet, they will not meet, leave their apartments, which had, mm -hmm. have become prisons essentially. Um, we'll have everything delivered, which is convenient in New York. I also went to my, and 50% is kind of like you know, pulsating and like wanting their old lives back. My office is in Rockefeller Center, which is in the middle of town, yeah. which is usually full with tourists. Mm -hmm. Tourists are completely gone because there are no tourists from Europe. Yeah. There are tourists in other areas that I've seen from Russia, India, South America, and not, I mean, good numbers, but of course it's not like it was before. Mm -hmm. And then every day, 
you saw more people, like little groups of people you could tell were dressed for the office with tie and mm -hmm. uh, suit. And um, you saw lines in front of restaurants, again, small lines and social distancing, longer lines like salad places. So of course you're looking for these things. You're trying to find indicators that life is going back to normal. And I think of now Corona is coming back. New York was super great. We had less Corona infections than Germany. But now that it's going out of control everywhere else in the United States, of course, it's coming back to New York. If that weren't the case, and this goes to my original point in the beginning, if Corona were controlled and uh, protectionism was somehow reigned in, I think New York would come back rather quickly. I think the way that things are going, it probably New York will see hard, a hard two to five years. Mm -hmm. But I think New York will always be New York. The fantastic buildings, many modern buildings, which with, uh, you know, great air filters and lots of space for people to socially distance. So I think New York will change. We'll probably have more tech companies come in. I don't think New York is dead. It, it just will take probably more time. And for a good while, it, it won't mm -hmm. be the same. But if you can come, I would totally urge you to come because I had the best time. It's it. New York lives through its people and most of the New Yorkers are there or are coming for a few days a week. And so it's still always, it's a great place. The reports on, on, on number of residents moving out of the city, um, um, are you, do you have any friends among them or? Well, I would or say, is it you know. greatly exaggerated or is it, is it actually happening? Uh, it is happening. I think final numbers, it's too early to tell because New York, of course, um, consists of Manhattan. Yeah. What you always see on postcards with uh, skyscrapers. Yeah. But then yeah. there are also four other um, suburbs, you know, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. Queens, Staten Island, and so forth. Yeah. So those, Manhattan is very wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, 1.7 million people live in Manhattan and 1.7 million people every day commute into Manhattan pre-corona. So the fact that many people have not come back, especially families, and that there's very few, very little commuting going on, of course, it's kind of quiet on the island. Mm -hmm. I think in the suburbs that are um, where less wealthy people live, more of them have been moving away because they're still expensive. It's still New York. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in New York, many people have the means to wait it out. Many people who live in New York have a second home, vacation home in the Hamptons in Florida. Uh -huh. um, many people are leaving their families in those places, uh, but they're coming back for two, three days a week or they're commuting daily even. There's this helicopter service people are paying. This is a mm -hmm. great number. I think 250 people out of, um, you know, my recollection right now is would be 250 people pay $800 a day to commute with a helicopter back and forth to the Hamptons, um, from the Hamptons to Manhattan. So I think bottom line, yes, there will be many people who will move away. Mm -hmm. Many families, because people will lose income and life is a lot cheaper in other places of the country. But I think it's too early to tell because people live in New York because they tick like New Yorkers. They mm -hmm. want the interaction with other people. They, mm -hmm. they go crazy. I mean, if they wanted to, they have all the money in the world. If they wanted to live in the country, they could have always moved to the country. Yeah. Uh, so I think not as many people will have permanently moved away as people think, but for the time being people, a lot of people are also staying away. Mm -hmm. so, so numbers are 500,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could probably be at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Thank Lidi. You, so, yeah. My pleasure. And, thank you uh, for your interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. Thank you. Same here. Mm -hmm.